okay so we may start uh, uh, and continue the the topic of uh, the task analysis that we discussed uh, the first time last week um, and we try to have a look at some of the techniques uh, that may be used a couple of techniques basically that we may use for task analysis mm -hmm. uh, let's remind uh, that uh, the the most important uh, uh, say goal of these uh, techniques for us is uh, being able to talk about uh, uh, tasks basically okay so especially when we will do the um, heuristic evaluations much later on about our uh, projects uh, uh, we need to think about which tasks we are asking our users to do and this with this concept here will help us and uh, one of the um, methods uh, for analyzing uh, the tasks that users perform uh, on a system or in general users perform because maybe we are or, or we already want to analyze the tasks before the system is uh, is um, is implemented uh, one uh, I, I was saying one of the techniques uh, is that of a hierarchical decomposition of the tasks uh, what that mean it means uh, one methodology for decomposing a task in a series of subtasks uh, like we started to 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 mention before um, and uh, organizing these subtasks into groups or sequences that are needed for the execution of these activities by by our users um, so uh, basically the, the the tool that we use for organizing these tasks will be a simple hierarchy okay which are bigger tasks at the top and then smaller and smaller tasks uh, in the in the lower branches of, of, a, of a big tree of, of activities uh, this just an example hmm, that is taken from one of the books uh, of uh, a hierarchical possible uh, representation of an hierarchical task analysis uh, concerning uh, how to clean a house. Okay, uh, so what we see here is that there are several tasks. Some are uh, in more higher level. For example, clean the house is the top level task. So actually, the task that we want to perform. And this task is not just an, an atomic task, uh, but it's uh, uh, composed of smaller ones. And so it, it's decomposed of five different uh, subtasks, like here. And some of these subtasks, uh, for example, number three, we'll see the detail in a moment, uh, is further decomposed into subtasks over lower levels, or sub subtasks if you want, and so on. Um, this is just a hierarchical dependency. So to perform task, uh, the main task number zero, uh, some one or many of the subtasks are needed. So we need to complete and accomplish uh, uh, some of these subtasks, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same cleaning the room means implies cleaning uh, one, two, three different rooms here, okay? Um, these are the, the tasks. Mm -hmm. At the composition like this, uh, this uh, does not imply you know, that you really need to do everything in order this is just a conceptual model okay then uh, we have a set of uh, plans which is separate from tasks uh, that describe us how to put together these plans sorry these tasks in order to achieve the result for example zero is a high level task and for completing this high level task we need a plan Plan zero is the plan for task number zero. And plan zero says that we need to do one, two, three, and five in that order. So get the vacuum cleaner out, fix the attachments to the vacuum cleaner of the tubes, clean the rooms, and then put the vacuum cleaner back into its closet and dismantle, dislodge all the, all the attachments. And sometimes, you also need to do four uh, when the dust bag is full or, or whatever condition so what we are saying is that uh, we need to, the task uh, is composed of set of subtasks but maybe only four of them needs to be executed in a specific order and another number four may be executed uh, or not depending on the cases and uh, um, so the the fact that we need or or we don't need to execute a task or the fact that the order is significant or not 
in the task decomposition is not something that we specify in the decomposition itself, but it's something that we specify in the plans. So the plans describe how to actually uh, we uh, execute our activities to run these tasks. Uh, the same example for task three, which is a, a complex task, which is composed of different subtasks. We have a plan uh, for describing how this task can be uh, executed. And it says that you can do any of 3.1 or 3.2 or 3.3. So one of them or two of them or all three of them in any order you like, depending on which rooms need cleaning. So in this case, we have optional activities. We have the optional ordering. We can choose the order in different ways. And we also have uh, the, um, the, 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 yes. Uh, the ordering and the and the optional optionality of the different tasks okay and uh, uh, so in a way we are sort of describing in a very simplified way a process one or many processes that we can uh, implement uh, and these processes uh, let's say are the are described by uh, by uh, trying to pick different activities from a set of possible uh, ones. Hmm. Uh, so this is a very simplified. It's not a, you know, a programming level. It's not a real uh, process model, no, because uh, it's uh, it, it lists out a lot of details. For, for example, what is what's the, the threshold for considering uh, a room that needs cleaning or not? What's the threshold for saying that the dust bag is uh, is uh, full or not? Okay. So all of these details that would be necessary sooner or later, right now we don't need to specify them, okay? Um, but uh, because we are trying to map the, the way in which the users are thinking and are executing on their tasks. And of course, different tasks uh, so can be, the plans, for example, can be defined in different ways. So the same tasks can be combined in a different way. So for example, plan three, we may have a, a better, um, um, a better description of task three saying, okay, but every every day we need to uh, clean the, the hall, for example, and uh, and the kitchen maybe, uh, the be uh, the living rooms once a week uh, and uh, the bedrooms only when we have visitors or it's a strange choice. I'm, I'm not recommending that, um, but uh, uh, it's, it's another possibility. So, the same tasks may be assembled in a different way according to different plans, uh, depending, of course, on the usage of the system by the users. So, uh, the hierarchical task decomposition it mainly comes out from observation. Uh, again, uh, we are trying to formalize what comes out from the observation, and from the observation of the, how the users are acting, we can uh, see which activities they are doing and try to combine them together into a hierarchy of tasks that are then executed through a sequence of subtasks and so on. Hmm? Uh, so it's a it's a uh, it's a, an iterative process where we observe and we try to refine what we observe, but also always it comes from uh, from the observation and from uh, asking users about why they are doing. Uh, uh, something, what uh, what will you do next, uh, what did you do before, and so on. So we try to understand and organize uh, their activities uh, uh, and also understand, uh, okay, what are the different options, for example, that, uh, uh, that may be you know, uh, chosen if something goes wrong or something is different and so on. So it's a, it's a sort of a tools, a, a way of uh, writing in another way the activities of the users, but not just uh, as a long list, uh, but we try to organize them according to main topics and to separate uh, you know, the tasks from the uh, from the plans. So what the individual activities from the way in which they combine themselves. So act, tasks and uh, and plans. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we should you shouldn't lose uh, three months in doing this uh, uh, task analysis, uh, but we need to stop when, of course, the level of detail becomes too little, so we don't extract re really meaningful information, or the activity is so normal, it's so standard, does it doesn't pose any risks of failure, so we can we can just uh, uh, stop there. Hmm? 
Um, to answer to the question by David, uh, uh, the task analysis usually comes after the interview, okay? Or it's a way of organizing the information coming out from the interview. So uh, it's uh, um, the, the need finding view, uh, the finding steps are very explorative steps. You go and listen, you discover new information, and then you need to uh, sit down and try to organize this information into a more uh, or ordered and organized uh, um, way or uh, representation. Uh, task analysis is one possible way in which you describe uh, uh, what, what you observe, for example, or the answer from the interview. Okay, uh, so it's, it's normally a, a next step uh, that can be needed uh, if the observation is complex or if there are many activities, or you break them down into different sectors and you only focus on some of them or something like that. Um, Okay, uh, here is some more complex example. Uh, there's a graphical depiction also uh, we, we may use uh, that is proposed in the in the literature of how to present uh, the, the the same task analysis, where the decomposition is described by the tree. So again, we have uh, in this case a task for making a cup of tea, and uh, uh, the, so zero is the main task. That is decomposed. Okay, you see this branching here. It is decomposed in one, two, three, four, five, six different tasks. And in particular, task one is decomposed in four subtasks down there here. Okay. Uh, and we have plans. We have the plan for the main task and the plan for the subtasks that need the refinement. Uh, we, we don't we don't want to go into details about this, but just to see that we are we also have a, a graphical representation we want. In this graphical representation, usually we use a sort of a symbol, a marker like this, like this line, for example, here, this line here, that says tells us I don't want to decompose it anymore. Let's stop here. Okay, uh, for me it's simple enough. I don't want to uh, add more more details about these activities or about these activities. While for activity number one, I will decompose it uh, further. Okay, so it's just a, a graphical idea. And of course, uh, these diagrams uh, can at first represent uh, a process that we are we have observed. Uh, what, but uh, we may we may refine it, we may improve it, uh, maybe to create a new a new task representation with better characteristic, which is might be more complete or whatever. Uh, let's uh, uh, be frank, but uh, be, 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 we, we need to be careful uh, about the level of detail in which we are writing this information, which are represented information. I found this example uh, quite interesting. Uh, imagine you're asking a user a question like, what are you doing now? So we are in the observation phase, we are taking notes, uh, and what are you doing now? And the same action, the user for the same action, the user may reply in a very different word ways i'm typing control b at the moment or it can tell you i'm making word bold which is the same okay one is the physical action and the other is the effect that control b has onto a, a document or emphasizing a word so it chose bold because he wanted to emphasize the, the word not because it's a side it's a title for example so it's a still higher level representation or even could tell you, oh, but don't you see I'm editing a letter, a document, hmm? uh, or I'm uh, preparing a legal case because this is the kind of document I'm, I'm preparing, I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Okay, so the, uh, we try, we need to try to be consistent and to find the, which is the level of detail in which you are representing. Okay, of course the low level like here is not very interesting. Uh, the very, very high level also is not very interesting because it's uh, maybe the top level goal. And we need probably to, I don't know, stop at this level. So these uh, uh, are two uh, detailed tasks. We don't want to represent them um, unless we are trying to design a new type of keyboard, of course, then control B is very important. But otherwise for the user activities, probably this part uh, is the part that we are focusing more on. So we need to also be aware say, of saying that under a given level of detail, we don't want to go into the, uh, the representation. Um, okay, so uh, there is also, as, as I mentioned before, the possibility of ref refining or checking the task analysis that we did before. Uh, so for example, 
uh, we see that uh, we have an action of uh, turning off the gas, okay? But if we check it, there's no action for turning on the gas. So uh, we should probably have uh, some check at the, at the, um, the matching of, uh, of activities hmm? uh, or trying to generalize. If we want to make more than one cup of tea, uh, do we need to boil different kettles, one per each cup? Or maybe we can factor in some, some complexity. So the task analysis is also a tool for trying to understand the different relationship between the, the activities and maybe restructure them in a different way. So this is the example uh, that we, we have. Uh, <laughs> this is a, it's reported practically uh, uh, everywhere because uh, everybody copied the same example by Benyon uh, that reported in, in their book. And it's a, a, a different uh, representation of the of the same task analysis with more detail, with some uh, um, uh, tasks that are more detailed. For example, making the pot uh, is uh, specified better. Uh, the fact that uh, we are filling the cups here, pouring the tea means filling the different cups is a loop here uh, because we may have many cups. And we see that here we have cups in plural. Uh, many cups for, for a given uh, kettle of water, okay? So in, in a way, it's also a, an evolution uh, tool, uh, okay, before, before, before going to, to the real system uh, specification. Uh, so uh, we, we don't need to do detailed task analysis for everything, of, of course, uh, but at least for the part of the system that we are going to uh, maybe to test, uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a tool. It's a tool that we may use. Uh, I, I in some way I agree with Enrico's comment because everybody probably uh, will find this boring. We don't need all the, these details. Of course, this is also a process that describes a physical activity. Uh, the task the task that we want to describe will probably involve uh, uh, the interaction of the user with the with our system. So it will be uh, they will be of, of a different nature. Okay. So instead of uh, maybe pouring the tea, we will write uh, enter some data in, in a form or confirm the data you you provided or something like that. Okay, so the actions will be different because we will describe uh, the interaction with the computer, not the interaction with a with a cup of water, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's up to us to um, use these tools if we need them. Uh, at a level where they are useful and not force ourselves to be too too detailed because otherwise we are losing just time without any added value so let, don't go into details in our, in our case um, okay the this one possibility uh, but as i said the main uh, point here is uh, we we get out with a clear idea of what the task is a beginning an end a set of activities, some rule to execute these activities. Then the way in which they're describing them is not very important for us, as long as we are very clear the difference between the task as a goal, for example. The goal is where we want to go. The task is the activity that they that they uh, need to, to execute to reach that goal. There's also another complementary view uh, for uh, analyzing uh, the outcome of the of the observation, which are complementary to task analysis, because it's not hierarchical in the composition, but basically it's conceptual. So it's try to relate the different concepts that are involved in the user. So when the user is executing some activity, uh, they are they are managing in their hand in their head some concept. You remember that uh, the task analysis questions were um, basically what you do and what you need to know. Hmm? Of course, what is your goal is what the first one, but after you know the goal, what are the actions that you do and what do you need to know for executing those actions? And the need to know part is captured more by the this sort of knowledge-based analysis. There are many methods here. We are just flashing two of them to have an idea. Hmm? Um, and uh, they describe what kind of knowledge, what kind of information, what kind of concepts you need to um, to execute a task. And uh, um, and they describe also the relationship between these uh, these kind of concepts. Um, the the tool usually uh, that we adopt for representing this kind of information are uh, simple taxonomies. 
taxonomies again are hierarchies of, of different levels, but the relationship is not of the composition of, a, of, a, of an action that we need to execute. It's rather the relationship from a more general concept to a more uh, specific one. So we uh, uh, navigate this hierarchy by uh, decreasing the level of, ex of, ex of abstraction. And this kind of uh, uh, representation, for example, we have a, an example of taxonomy of the car control. So the, the kind of control that you find uh, in your car. And so the, in general, we have a very high concept of motor control. And these may be steering control, maybe engine control, maybe light controls, maybe, uh, let's say, uh, windshield controls, uh, heating controls, and so on. Uh, and so we are not implying a sequence we are not even implying a goal we are not saying what we want to do but we are describing the knowledge that we have when we enter this complex system which is a car and this uh, i when i say i know how to control a vehicle it means that i know how to control the steering the the brakes uh, the the, um, the lights uh, and other types of controls that in my mind they are they fall into different categories and of course, this decomposition can also uh, go uh, into sub-concepts. For example, the lights may be the outside lights or the internal lights, which are all lights. But for me, they fall into different categories because one is for driving, the other maybe is for seeking uh, objects in, inside the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at the bottom level, we have the actual objects uh, mm -hmm, that are belong to this category. Uh, so it's a completely different uh, uh, mapping of the knowledge that comes out from the users. Uh, it's not procedural at all. It doesn't tell you in which order or which task you can achieve by combining these concepts. It only gives you the vocabulary organized in a hierarchical way. Um, of course, uh, you, we may have uh, different points of view. Uh, for example, uh, concerning the, the wipers, we can decompose uh, according to the function. So the, the windshield controls may be uh, for wiping the front and back uh, glasses and for washing them, or we, we may uh, decompose them according to the location. So uh, or we, we group conceptually all the control for the front windshield and uh, all the control for the back glass of the car. And in this case, in same, the same, inside the same location, we have different functions, the wipers and the washer, for example. They are all valid. They are just uh, depending on the kind of conceptual decomposition you make. So what is the purpose uh, of uh, this kind of uh, conceptual decomposition? Uh, basically, it's, uh, uh, it's, it was mentioned here. Uh, it helps us to organize the information. So have an explicit uh, information model you remember that one of the main problems of, of the analysis is the mapping of the user mental model with the system model. And so we have an explicit organization. And if we are building our system according to this organization, we are implement, we will be implementing the functionality according to these rules. And at the same time, we will probably define the navigation of the application according to the same model. So maybe the menus or the location of the grouping or the visual design of the, of the page will reflect these concepts. So the user will find it easier to find the control they need in the area where they're more, it's more reasonable for them to look for or to, to seek, okay? Um, so uh, in, in this kind of uh, conceptual decomposition, it's very useful for defining the layout of a page. So what are the different parts of the page uh, what are the different functions? And we assign different functions uh, or different concepts for two different parts of the page. We don't care about the order in which they are needed. The order maybe is the user that will decide, but at least we make them easy to find. Or the same is uh, defining the menus. The, uh, what, are, what's the, what are the labels on the main menu of, our, of my application? And uh, uh, this, uh, as um, Andrea mentions, uh, this. Uh, kind of uh, analysis is uh, in most of the cases independent, separate from the hierarchical task analysis. In one case, we want to see the sequences of actions 
and the other case we want to see the mental model the conceptual model of the application so they are two different tools they respond to different questions the first is what do the users do task analysis hierarchical task analysis and the second is uh, what do the users need to know and how do they do, I, do they organize uh, that knowledge and in this case we have these knowledge methods this is just the basic okay there are many more complex representations like uh, uh, structure the composition but we, we don't need to uh, to go into these details no? but for example you can see some some examples that uh, for example in this window we see different parts of the window that are dealing with different concepts concerning uh, formatting of single characters okay so we have uh, something that is related uh, to the to the font basically no? the font is, is is divined in the into a face into weight and to and, and size so if we know something about fonts we see that fonts have these concepts that need to be specified and uh, they are separate from the effects that we may apply on the fonts that are modifications uh, of over the basic fonts and they are separate from uh, uh, the decorations decorations are uh, maybe uh, highlighting are uh, coloring and something like that so even in the design uh, in this case of a dialogue window uh, we try to put together uh, different controls that fall into the same conceptual area of course there are also many other constraints because this part this window uh, by its nature is very big uh, so it cannot be put together with this uh, checkbox for example because uh, there will there will be a very bad and unbalanced uh, um, use of of the space but we must first think about the conceptual relationship and then of course uh, map that to to visual attributes so this, this is one of the in many cases we are doing this without an explicit taxon without writing explicitly the concepts uh, but we we can recognize it in in, uh, in many user interfaces okay uh, so this was just uh, no uh, as you as you saw a quick uh, a quick overview of the different uh, of some different methods in task analysis uh, we'll try mm, we will in our project we don't uh, require to do them no? okay for uh, for the project but at least there are tools uh, that we not need to know or to, or to remember in the moment when we maybe uh, informally mm, but we need to use them uh, during the, the 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 next stages of design and talking about the next stages of design, uh, the topic that I want to begin today is uh, uh, prototyping, which is a big topic. Uh, it's one of the key topics uh, in uh, human computer interaction processes. Uh, um, being able to test, to try to discover the usability of a system before the system is completed. Without these prototyping techniques, there would be no usability, no user, no, no user human computer interaction uh, processes. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, where are we? Uh, we did the the, the initial uh, idea. Uh, we want to help some users in some activities. We define the users, the content, and so on. We are uh, after the need finding phase. So we did all the tools, we used some tools for uh, need finding. Uh, maybe the outputs of this uh, are maybe formalized, or at least we may read them in our mind uh, with the instruments of task analysis and knowledge uh, um, organization. And the next step uh, is starting to move uh, towards uh, a system that we satisfy these needs. Okay, so we are moving from analysis to design. Right? It's a key point where we are putting the backbone of our system. Uh, we have some needs. We decided what needs the users have, and we need to find an idea of how to satisfy them. We will never get the good, the best idea at first, at the first try, okay? We need to try and modify and test and try again and so on until we make it good. And so we, we need some tools, some instruments, some procedures that will help us try different solutions and see how they go. And finally, 
uh, decide on uh, the best ones uh, to proceed uh, with the next stages of, of design, which is implementation and testing and evaluation and so on. And so this is the, the, the goal, okay, the phase. Um, we already have the project idea. We already have the need finding. We have decided one or two at the end of the finding, which are the, the, the phase in which you are now in your labs, uh, uh, the goal is to find one or two user needs. Okay, uh, when we have these needs, uh, the next step will uh, will start, and uh, we need to invent something. Hmm? This process is called env envisionment. So making ideas visible. You have an idea of how to solve your problem, how to propose a solution to your users, and you want to to make it visible, to show it. Huh? An idea is something that is only in your brain. You need, you need to make it concrete, you make it physical. And this is a process for helping you to create new ideas, throwing away bad ideas uh, uh, or keeping good ideas. And of course, good or bad is not for you to say or for me to say, it's for your users to say. So if I have an idea, I need to test with my users whether this idea is good or not. And uh, I cannot just describe the idea, but I need to show them, show to the user what, what would be the final result uh, if this idea was implemented or not. And uh, there are many different tools. So prototyping is a big category that um, encompasses many different uh, techniques, many different tools uh, that are used in different stages uh, of the design, of course. So very, very early, uh, we may we may be just uh, draw a very quick sketch of the user interface, uh, but if, uh, in the last stages before the implementation, we may be probably have a very detailed uh, color uh, mock-up uh, with a near final final design. Hmm? And it also depends on uh, who is your uh, user, you know, whether you are showing the uh, the prototype to their actual users or to marketing or to ca customers or whatever. Uh, so we will see uh, so a, a quite a good range of uh, of different prototypes. But the key point here, so what not to do here, is thinking too uh, early about the user interface. Okay, of course, uh, a prototype will show some kind of interface, but the goal here is not of validating the interface. Rather, is validating the task that we want to support. So that is where the task analysis comes useful. Uh, we want to show to a user how a task may be accomplished. So we may, and the task is composed of actions and sequences. So you need to go to do this and that and that. And for doing these different actions, the user must have the conceptual grounding for understanding what kind of actions they do. So also the conceptual model is important here. We are trying to map them into an interface, of course, but the, uh, the, the output of the prototype will be a better understanding of the task, the design of the task. Then we have all the time, once the tasks are well-defined and are tested and well understood by, the, by our users and by ourselves as designers, then we have all the time for making the interface better. Uh, all the all the layouts, all the color of the graphical issues, and so on. They come later. Uh, they only we need to care about those only when we know which information is needed at which stage. Then we decide we decide how to put them and the, the spacing and the fonts and so on. Okay, so let's uh, we don't want to be too precise on the user interface because it's too early. We don't even know whether a given information is needed or not because we didn't define the task or validate the task yet. And so we are just testing, trying, okay? Exploring basically different alternatives. We want something where it's very easy to test an idea and then half an hour later we test a different one. So we don't need a method that requires three days of implementation for testing a new idea. We need something really quick with a quick turnaround with a very low cost. Otherwise we will never test 10 ideas. It's better to test 10 ideas in one day 
than to spend 10 days just to try to evaluate one single idea. It may be just a stupid thing to say, but it's, it's a reality. And so if we can explore what the users are doing, uh, we can explore how the user will behave on different types of devices. So it, if you are connecting to this website on a mobile or on a tablet or, or on a computer, will you behave in the same way? And, uh, and also concerning the user interface layout, maybe we can test different types of layouts very quickly. You need to spend one week tweaking your CSS for making all the alignment work, and then maybe throw everything away because you, then you will change to the totally different types of layout. So uh, one very important characteristic of, the, of the prototype is that they should be cheap, easy to do, not too, many, not too, too expensive to do. And there are many techniques. We will just uh, maybe enter uh, uh, or detail some of them. For, for some of them, we'll spend more time because they are the ones that we are most likely to use. For some others, we are. I, I will only give some some quick uh, say ideas of, or or example. And all of these techniques are just for different types of prototyping techniques. Uh, so, for example. The simplest type of a prototype uh, is just a sketch. Just gives you a quick drawing showing what the user interface uh, or what the device or what the interaction within the user device uh, may look like. Hmm? So we are trying to describe you something, okay, but then you have a screen where you can enter the information or where you can see your best friends where they are located and so on i just i just make a quick sketch like that uh it may be basically the uh, the the sketch of a screen when it's implicit that the user will be using the device or if you are thinking about thinking about a physical space uh, and maybe it's also a device a physical device uh, how and how different devices interact and it's also interesting uh, always to think about the user in the picture. We have a hand here and a hand there. It's not that the problem is not the hand, is we really should think the user inside the environment, inside the interface while the user is interacting. It's not just a, um, a screenshot, but it's a situation. It's a static view. It's something that only gives us a sort of a, a snapshot, an instant of time, while uh, the user is, is interacting with the system. And usually these sketches are integrated into stories, uh, into a set of sketches that describe a sequence of steps uh, for the interaction, we'll see in a moment. So these are some examples that I just found uh, on the internet about uh, uh, possible sketches. Uh, you see, there's not a lot of design here. There's not, a, there are not colors, there are not uh, precise layouts. Uh, yeah, for example, here we, we can understand that we have some pictures and these pictures, some of them are selected and maybe they are selected because they match this filter because I see that I see that there is some color coding there, uh, but we don't see all the pictures there. We don't need them. We already understand what is in this interface, what will be shown there. Okay, and then we can try to understand, okay, is this a good choice or not? Uh, for example, in this picture, I don't understand uh, what uh, the red borders are representing here. The purple ones uh, probably are linked to the purple button, but what are the red ones? So there's some piece of information which is not, is it important or not? Is it shown or not in this interface? So we can also already start here thinking about what is important. And if something is important, how can we show it? For example, even with a very quick sketch, something will take three minutes to draw, to draw not much more. You see that they are not computer uh, images here. Something just pencil and paper because it's faster. Because you can edit it. Uh, you, you don't care about it whether you are, if you are not pixel perfect, if you're not completely aligned. It's just a sketch on a, on a piece of paper. A different kind of sketches uh, would may be useful, but uh, uh, probably in a different stage uh, are maps uh, that are conceptual overviews uh, of uh, uh, this, 
of the different pages or the different activity or different uh, uh, sections of your application. Mm -hmm. The navigation page uh, for this, this was taken from one of the old, very old uh, smart, uh, not smartphone, featured phones before the smartphones, uh, where you have a menu button and you had to navigate the menu button only with two keys, uh, forward, backward, uh, into, in uh, and out. And so there was a map that helped you to, to reach all the items uh, that you needed. Or right now we, have, we, may have a, we have a map for navigating a website. So it's another way of checking how and whether the user can find their way into their website. We can visualize them and we see, okay, but I feel that going to this page is too complex. So we'll try to simplify or to organize the information in a different way. Or did the user actually agree that this should be the main uh, pages of, of the website? Are they conceptually similar at the same level? And so on. These are quite uh, simple tools. Another tool for, you see that we are using the, the word prototype in a very wide way. This is just a picture, it's a prototype for what? Yes, but it's already something that we can help us to think about the system. And it's very quick and easy to correct if something is wrong. Um, we will learn some techniques for helping or for um, helping us with the users to check some, to find some errors in some prototypes. There's another type of prototype, prototype sorry, which is even stranger. It's called the scenario which is just a written story uh, where you tell, we describe in text or with voice, with a podcast or whatever, um, that we describe what the user is doing. What is it doing? How do the user inter interact with the system and so on? Uh, you may know maybe, for example, by software engineering, the techniques of uh, use case description. This is uh, one possible scenario in which uh, the user uh, is described while the user is interacting with the system. And you see the exchange of information of the, between the system and the user, and you see the, uh, the information that is being exchanged. And knowing which information is exchanged is uh, crucial for understanding what widget and what items to put uh, into the web page uh, corresponding to that step. Um, and this is just a written story, but in many cases, we want to make this story easier to convey and we want to make it visual. That's why we very often use storyboards. Okay. Uh, let me skip this one. Uh, storyboards are just uh, visual stories where we combine the power of a scenario that is able to describe a, an organized list or sequence of interactions with the power of sketches that will give us a very quick but powerful flash of what the user is doing and what the system is showing at, the mo at a given moment in time. And uh, uh, a storyboard is sort of a comic book, a uh, uh, comic presentation uh, describing the user actions in different moments uh, of, uh, of, it, of its, uh, Sorry, let me move this one, sorry, out of the way. Okay, um, how the, um, you uh, describe, they describe in different, with different, uh, uh, say, bo uh, moments, with different uh, instances of time, they describe what is happening. So. Uh, this one is not very easy to understand at first, uh, but we see a person which is thinking and is searching something on, on the smartphone. They're entering a space. Uh, a lot of people are, are, are talking, but then he will use in a way a, a QR code for finding their way in, in a city or something like that. Okay, uh, so this one tells us something that a person is doing is not very clear maybe we should be careful that here we have a, a smart code a qr code that maybe is the same that we show there so they're in some way related uh, it's not very clear here because we are missing the story we have just some pictures 
but we don't know how to glue them together. Uh, that's why usually uh, storyboards uh, uh, needs to tell the story, how they how it unfolds, uh, what people are doing, what people are thinking, what people are saying, what information they are exchanging. And this is, for example, is a much uh, uh, more interesting uh, way of representing a possible storyboard. So, okay, let's let's have a look at this one. We have a person. We see, uh, first of all, the, the drawing is very minimal by design. And since it's very minimal, every detail is important. Okay, Every detail will catch our attention because we are there are so few details that everyone should be important. So if we have a clock here, then we'll tell us the time of the day. So it's something like 6 o'clock. So this person is going home after. Uh, um, uh, a day of work and we have uh, the information about what this person is thinking or saying so he wants to go home and uh, uh, this person is checking on his phone what to cook but they have no signal for example here but for at least they have an app that will work, work also underground and uh, uh, the app will give a suggestion. So you say that the smartphone is doing something and the person will say, oh, we have a suggestion from, from the smartphone. And then, then he stops at the grocery store and will buy all the ingredients uh, that he needs uh, because uh, the smartphone will tell them uh, the recipes. And the same smartphone is here and will help them to uh, prepare the meal and finally they can they can eat it or something like that okay so uh, Enrico is saying that also this picture is confusing yes it may be but at least we have a way of decoding it okay in the first case there were only pictures so we didn't we didn't have too much context uh, it was not a uh, you know, uh, standalone that, that kind of picture um ah, okay so yes i agree um and this is another possible story, another possible storyboard. It's a story it's drawn in a board um, for the same type of application, for exploring different types of uh, tasks that can be supported by this application. So probably these people were thinking about uh, a system for helping the user prepare their meal. So that was the, the need, helping the user prepare their meal. And they are exploring different ways of doing that. One was uh, suggesting ingredients and uh, um, showing the recipe. And the other case, uh, it's another case where it's 8 p.m. It's too bad, it's too late. And so this person is too late for doing any shopping. And uh, pizza delivery is too slow. It will take uh, 45 minutes because everyone is ordering out this tonight. And so they are very busy. But uh, you can check what it has in the fridge. And you see that these three panel, panels here, from here to there, don't involve any app, any smartphone or whatever. They are just setting the context. Say, so, okay, this person is in a situation where it's late. They don't want to um, order some food outside or it will be too late uh, to, to come in. And they uh, already have something in the fridge. And so they want to cook something quickly uh, with the ingredients that they already have. I could tell this with words, but if I tell a story in a visual way, it's much easier to put yourself in the shoes of that person, to, to enter into that room, into that house and be that man, okay? And uh, uh, right now, the functionality of the app, the task that the app is helping me to do is uh, entering here and will tell me, okay, but with these ingredients, uh, you have some recipe that will only take 15 minutes and it's easy and uh, it's not it's uh, no, a good diet and so by 8 30 so sooner than when the pizza would arrive i'm already ready to eat so these are possible tools okay that will help us first of all inside the design group we are discussing an idea i have an idea you have one if we never argue, okay, because we are we always try to discuss and find the best solution. It's not about uh, arguing or, or being right or righter than others. It's about uh, uh, finding the better solution. 
but uh, it's very difficult to exchange opinions about what we think a good task would be, what we think a good action would be. So uh, it's very easy to reason about a, a storyboard like this, for example. So I say, okay, but uh, at this point here, we are missing an action. So how does the app know uh, which ingredients we have on the fridge? Do you need uh, to enter in the, in the app uh, all the ingredients? Uh, and it's, very, it's a very boring uh, phase uh, uh, that will take uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, uh, of sweating users that uh, need to enter all this information uh, inside the app so that the app can do the, the, the suggestion later on. Ah, yes, I forgot about this step then. Okay, it will not poss be possible uh, by 8.30 because uh, this will already take uh, you know, 20 minutes by itself. Uh, so this person is very sad and is sweating because it's uh, entering a lot of information. So this is a very, very bad drawing, but will help me discuss with you whether this step is necessary or not. Or you're saying, no, 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 but uh, you don't need this because uh, maybe you have a sensor that knows everything, which is not feasible, by the way, so forget about that. And so it's a different way of, of knowing this information and so on. Hmm? So by playing with this, uh, the first step uh, also for uh, for uh, responding to uh, Abdulaziz's uh, question, uh, the first users are ourselves. It's a tool for clarifying in the design group, among the members of design group, uh, what we want to propose. What is the task that we are trying to support? And then we can use that in focus groups, for example, for discussing with the user, for showing them to the users for having a quick discussion with some test users. Okay, uh, we want to do this and uh, let's see, what are your comments about uh, this person? Do you feel, uh, uh, do you find yourself in such situations? Would you react in the same way? Hmm? So sort of a, a support for doing an interview. We are not using this tool in the in this course for uh, for prototyping. We, are, we will be using the next one, which is even more powerful, okay? But at least we have this, uh, we'll ask you, uh, to, to to develop some storyboards to explain us or to explain yourselves, um, but also to explain us in the deliverable what you want to accomplish. So what are the scenarios that the task that the application uh, uh, want to support? And uh, uh, we should always remember that a storyboard uh, must uh, start from the people and from the task. So who is doing what and where. After that, after this is clear, who is the person and what they're trying to do and what is their context, it's late, they are at home, they are in the, in the metro or whatever. Only after we can focus on what actions they do, what are the sequences of steps. We, we don't see, in none of this, we are really seeing the user interface. It's just, something with some lines and dashes, some dots and squares. It's, we don't see the user interface, but we could understand the content or what that interface would look like, not the visual look, but the content. Uh, we could understand because we saw what the person was thinking or what information the person had back. So we are in a way, uh, describing the effect of showing some information on an interface without showing the interface. And it's good because we don't know to sh we don't want to show the interface right now. It will be much later. But we have no, uh, if you think about it, we have no problem in not seeing the right, the detailed interface. We, are, we everybody, every, each of us um, could understand perfectly what the, that uh, smartphone was doing at that time. Okay, and so the sequence of steps are the, the order in which the information is given or the order in which the information is required and what kind of interaction the user needs to do with their device for getting information, I'm getting a notification, I'm entering some data, I'm getting some result or whatever. And what will start the task also? You know, the, there was only the first panel was setting the trigger. This person at, uh, is out of the work, or no, it's, uh, they are entering home, in this case, or it's, this is a house, it's not a workplace. 
uh, they're entering home and they realize it's late. In that other case, the, 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 the whole story is, starts when the person is leaving. So we are situating the task in a given context, in a given time, where this task could be uh, normally required by the users. And then, of course, we are illustrating the, the, the task. And the task should have a, a good ending. No? The, the last panel should show that the user could reach their goal. It's important because it will help us to understand what is their goal. Uh, when is the task finished? OK, when the user reached what they wanted to do. So it's very important to be explicit about uh, this is what they wanted to do. They reached it. They had it. OK, uh, so the, the end result of the, inter of, the, of the whole interaction is basically the main motivation for starting the task. I'm not executing a task because I like pushing fingers on a smartphone. I'm executing a sequence of steps because I know where I'm going. I know the end result. And so I, three minutes before, 30 minutes before, I will start some actions because I know that later I will have the results that I'm seeking for. So, so the, the final point it will also help us to clarify the needs. Okay, the needs were having a quick dinner in that, in that example. Uh, having the dinner first and have it without spending too much time uh, or with or trying to uh, cope with the constraints of what he could buy or what he already had in the house. That was the goal that started the interaction that for which the person at a given point uh, picks the phone out of their pockets and said, let's open this application. Because I know that if I do this, uh, it will require me some steps, some interaction, enter some data, but at the end, I will have the goal reached, which is not playing with the, uh, with the application, rather it's uh, having a, a good dinner. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, uh, storyboards should describe uh, some actions, something in movement, okay? So we use the, the usual uh, you know, uh, hints that we have in comic books. Uh, uh, for example, we, want, we, want, we, we may see what the, the people are, 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 are saying or what they are thinking with bubbles, the same convention. Uh, we may have the notion, uh, for example, of, of movement. So, so the, if the person is running, we want to draw them in a, I don't know, in a dynamic position, especially where uh, so I, we, 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 we say that, okay, they are quickly moving in a direction. So we uh, now have some, some graphical hints uh, uh, that are very easy to decode for us because we are used to, to seeing them in illustrations. And uh, uh, so people, what they're saying, what they're thinking, what they're doing, how they're moving. Um, and uh, uh, it's usually it's enough to understand the action. Hmm? Well, in some cases, you, you may need something more sophisticated, but in most cases, uh, actually, you don't. Hmm? And uh, we see that all these storyboards uh, are hand-drawn. And this is a, well, one could say, okay, but why, why don't you, you use a tool for drawing that? There are a lot of uh, drawing tools out there and so on. Well, they are slower, usually. Uh, I want something quick. I don't want to spend time uh, because if I use the graphical tools, I will need to be perfect with the size. So if I'm drawing a man three times, uh, uh, probably it will have three different sizes. Okay, it's so, uh, here yeah, and then it will not be for perfect any time. They will all be different. If I'm using a tool, I need to copy and paste uh, uh, every time, and they want exactly the same person to be recognizable and so on. And uh, uh, I will lose time because this is not essential. The essential point is to give you an idea of the task that we are trying to support. And so the quicker it is, to draw something, the more scenarios we can explore in the same amount of time, with the same amount of budget. And it's very important that we don't spend all of our time in designing one possible scenario, and then we are stuck with that. We want to design five of them, 10 of them, and then throw them away, except maybe one or two. That is why we need something quick, and we are done Oh, okay, we, we don't feel guilty if we throw something away. It's just a piece of paper, okay? 
I throw it away, let's start another one. It just took 30 seconds to draw. And also, it's imprecise. And, uh, and this is good, because if, they, if people see that it's just a quick uh, drawing, they don't feel too bad if they criticize it. It's obvious we, that is a, it's a quick drawing. Okay, so if something is wrong, they have no problem in telling you that. If you try to do something much more polished, our users psychologically will be less okay, favorable in of making criticism or say, because they see that something is well cured, well designed. And so they, they, they understand that a lot of work went into that. Okay, so they will try to make maybe minor uh, comments and not major ones. And you are telling them to, in some way, subliminally, subconsciously, to focus on the content. Okay, you see, the graphics is not good. The layout is not decided. But the only thing that you see is the content, what the person is doing and what the application is doing. This is what I want you to focus on in this moment. And that is why I'm only showing you some hints, some bad drawings, uh, so that you can, the only information you can get is this one. If you want to criticize it, you can do that because it's just you know, a draft. It's not a very polished document where uh, you, will, you, you, you feel that you need to have a strong motivation in order to criticize something. There are no fonts or colors. You cannot say, I want this a little bigger or I don't like this font because there are, there are no fonts and the sizes are just random because you see that they are just approximate. Uh, and to answer to Andrea, yes, this is the common practice. Yes, even the professional world, maybe there is somebody where uh, has a better hand at drawing that I have, but it's important that at this stage, when you are in the early stages of exploration, don't be too precise because otherwise you are fixing too early some choices without uh, validating other ones. Okay, so maybe you have an, an, a, a better illustrator, of course, but uh, you need to still, uh, the idea is here, uh, don't waste time in doing something too precise because you want to test many of them and throw them away, most of them at least. Hmm? And so, uh, as you say, you see, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at drawing, but uh, I'm really totally bad at drawing anything, but I could make some, people shapes that are more or less understandable. So there are different styles uh, where you can draw something that, okay, they are not people, okay? They're just sketches that are easy to recognize as people. So there are different styles. You can find your own style, where uh, the one that you prefer. Uh, so this, the, the, the style that I used before is so-called the star people because they are sort of uh, five pointed stars. The, the fifth point is behind the head. And uh, they are easy to make uh, in different poses, different positions, but also stick people uh, are, are, uh, are easy to draw. If you, if you follow the comic called the XKCD, you see that there are uh, a lot of comics that are very good ones, by the way, and all with people drawing this way. And with a little details, okay, you can make this uh, uh, into 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 a girl, for example. You just make a, a I don't know a bang out of that. Sorry, it came out very bad. Uh, or or um, you can change some attributes to make uh, different people uh, recognizable. Huh? If if uh, if you do that, so you can choose one of many different styles. You don't need to be perfect. You need to draw um, Walt Disney style uh, comics. Okay something like really uh, sketches that gives us about enough information to understand what these people, people, okay, these sketches of people are doing hmm? and not uh, uh, their, their specific details. We don't need to focus on the color of the eyes or how they are dressed um, unless it's specific to our application. So we, we can focus on the real information that we want to explore at this stage. And so this is also uh, important. And then, of course, while we go forward, we will more will be more and more precise, okay, in our in our uh, prototypes. Uh, and so uh, right now we 
we you know, played with some exploration tools, basically, to explore the uh, interaction, the task that the user is want, wants to accomplish with the help of our system. Uh, when we are talking about prototypes, in many cases, we are switching our focus to the interface or to the device. Um, so no longer the whole uh, scenario as a storyboard, but let's now focus on that smartphone that you have inside the storyboard. What's in that in, uh, as, as smartphone? What's in that interface? What do you have there? And uh, again, so we are zooming. Let's imagine you have your prototype here where the main focus is on the person or what the person is doing. One, and this is the most important information. Define the task of the person and describing them in, the, in an easy way to reason about. Once we decided the task, at a given point, uh, we should ask the question, OK, but what's in the screen? Right now, for defining the task is not important. But for specifying the application, it becomes important. And now we want to focus on that part. And so build, uh, not build the application because it will take three months, but build uh, a prototype of the application, something that looks like the real thing, but it is not a real thing. Uh, it's a concrete implementation, but partial. So it's something real, but fake, hmm? but not really real. Okay, it's something that looks like the real thing, but it's not. And should be, also we are still in the exploration phase, easy to modify. Again, we, it's not something that should require many days of implementation, okay? But may let the users, uh, uh, in a way, feel the interactivity with the system, even if the system doesn't exist yet. So again, we are just to, to, to remind you, we are still in the exploration phase. We are exploring different ideas. We are visualizing different ideas. And we are testing whether an idea is good or not with something which is really still quick of course, maybe it's more demanding than, a, than a just a, a storyboard, but it will still be quicker to implement. And we have a real big spectrum of what we call prototypes. Okay, storyboards is just the, the simplest ones because they, you see the interface in context, but you don't see the real interface. So you see it, but you don't see it. It's a, it's a normal um, um, say, uh, state of the things uh, when you are describing prototypes. You are seeing something which is not the real thing, but we still understand, or in your imagination, you're complete, uh, I would look like. And how to something, uh, you know, the, final uh, the final product is a prototype of itself, basically. So the end point is there. In the middle, we have a lot of uh, uh, different levels of uh, fidelity. Uh, that may be more and more similar to the end result or more and more similar to a very quick sketch. And of course, uh, uh, the amount of time that we need for implementing each of these, but this is also the amount of time uh, in which we are uh, developing uh, the, um, the application, okay? Because uh, um, at the beginning, we are more in an exploration phase, uh, later on, maybe when we are six months, uh, eight months into a project, we want to uh, test more the specific interface. Uh, and uh, uh, and so we need uh, uh, to go to something that includes more fidelity, more realism. Mm -hmm. So we'll have uh, some and an overview of some of these, uh, uh, of the prototypes that are located in this, located in this, uh, in this continuum of possibilities. Uh, and we see that each type of prototype uh, will help us discover different aspects of our project. So the storyboards, we say that they are fantastic for visualizing tasks and reasoning about the task and refining the tasks that are, of course, maybe they are, uh, we use that uh, task analysis, but then we want, we want to put that into the context and test it with users in a way that they can understand it. Uh, when we go to, to, to mock-ups or interactive prototypes, we start to deal about the usability of the design issues. And in the middle, 
we have this very important tool of paper prototypes that we are going to spend uh, some amount of time, uh, time in, in analyzing that will help us in uh, uh, seeing how the interactions with the interface may work. Okay, so it's the very first uh, uh, design of the interface uh, before all the visual design issues, uh, but more you know, the, the, the content, designing of the content of the interface. And again, quick iterate. We want to have quick solutions in order to iterate many times. Okay, so this is not a, a waterfall uh, model. It's something that we try and change our mind and change idea and so on, because until we get to this level here, until to get to these levels in this corner, everything will be really inexpensive to build and so inexpensive to, to throw away and restart from, from scratch or change it even radically. Um, and in this spectrum, there are many types of, uh, of prototypes. Uh, they are, here are more or less graded by level of, of fidelity or complexity. And uh, they can be seen by different types of prototypes. So we have this, kind, this picture that try to classify the many different types of prototypes according to different categories. Uh, I'm not going to spend uh, much time to, to read all this categorization, okay? but we'll work more on the basic of, of, of examples. Uh, uh, so we see that, first of all, we, we can define the purpose of a prototype uh, depending on the, the goal by which we are designing it. Okay, Do we want to uh, analyze whether a product is useful or not? Or do we want to analyze the interaction? Or we want to analyze the ease of finding or of, of pressing of a button, for example. And that, of course, will change the way in which we develop the prototype. Mm -hmm. um, the prototype uh, is, uh, we can create it for involving some users, like you will do uh, next week in the lab, not, not this one. Um, and, uh, uh, and so use the prototype for involving the users and trying the interaction in the wild or is easier maybe in a controlled exper experiment or maybe use the prototype with some experts uh, that will tell you whether something is going to work or not. The main difference also to answer Michele uh, between the prototype that you are building and the initial sketches is that the prototypes can be are, are interactive, are evolving. A sketch is just one screenshot, a prototype is a screenshot that may evolve, may change in a way according to the user actions. And we see some tricks to make them exchange uh, in a moment. Uh, okay, I, I said that I will skip all these definitions here. Uh, you, you, can, you can read them uh, later if you want, but they are not uh, too important for our focus. Uh, you see that many, many uh, um, prototypes are thrown away by design. Okay, uh, we design them because we want them to answer some questions. There are tools for asking questions. And once I have the response to that question, I don't need the tool anymore. So I can move on, I can forget it. Hmm? Or in some cases, this prototype can be incremental. So I can keep it and then on the next step, on the next iteration of the design, I will make a better version of the same prototype and the better version uh, again, until maybe the prototype will evolve into the final system. It's not very easy to do that because you need uh, really a convergent process. Uh, in many cases, uh, uh, it's, it's easier to just stop with the prototypes and start with implementation also because they will use probably uh, different technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and these prototypes may be very far from complete. They don't need to represent all the functionalities, all the tasks of the system. Uh, they may just represent a single part, a single portion, because this is the part where we want to get answers from the user from, okay? So if we are interested in uh, finding information, we only model maybe the search uh, functionalities of the system, the tasks related to search, and all the rest will be just blank pages. We don't care about that, okay? So we, we must have a shallow representation of the whole website or just a deeper representation of, of a part of it. Huh? depending on the question we want to answer. So we should always be clear about 
um, the, the, the question, the information they want to get. And of course, uh, the, the level of fidelity in many cases is low, but it may become a bit higher in some cases if we want to investigate about something that is related to the graphical aspects of the, of the prototype. And again, uh, of course, uh, we may have a prototyping that in some way uh, is interactive, uh, even if uh, maybe a sketch is just static, but we want to do something that well, the user could feel the interaction. Um, and we see some, some techniques or some tricks to trick the user into thinking that they have an information. Okay. Um, about fidelity, just uh, consider these two pictures. Okay. They are the same window. They represent the same window. But uh, in the, if you look at them for a couple of seconds, in the right one, the right hand side one, probably you will focus more on the details. And in the left one, uh, the left hand uh, picture, there are no details to focus on because everything is so weakly, so badly wrong, drawn. So the only thing that you can put your attention on is on the content. So you are more likely, for example, to read these names here in the tabs. While here, maybe something that Okay, we take for granted there are different types, uh, and we are more attracted by maybe by the, the the widgets here, the buttons, or the details there, hmm? or this frame here, or some. Our eyes will go to different places. Here, there are no details. There are no fine details to fix on. There are no fine, um, no, uh, you know, uh, shadows uh, uh, to 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 like or to dislike. Uh, and so we can only uh, reason about uh, what is written, the content that is in this, uh, pic in this picture. So the level of fidelity is not that we want to make better or worse pictures. We choose the level of fidelity according to what information we want to get. We want to get information about how we align, how we design the, uh, decide the widgets. Let's go to a higher fidelity. We want to have uh, information about uh, whether the user is finding the information that they need here, we go maybe to a lower fidelity so that the user are focused on the only thing that is there. Okay. Um, so let's start uh, having a look at these uh, famous paper prototypes, uh, which are one uh, possible techniques uh, for creating interactive prototypes at a very low cost. Uh, uh, basically, they are a mock-up of the part of some user interface on paper. So a sort of a sketches on the interface, but uh, you have many of these sketches that represent different moments in the interaction of the user. Uh, so for example, if you imagine having a, a smartphone with some uh, uh, you know, text shown inside the screen, if you want to model the swiping of the text, uh, what you could do is to make a longer piece of paper and put it behind a, a, a fake uh, cover, a fake border of the smartphone frame. Thank you. And uh, and you just uh, while you swipe with the finger, you are just moving the paper up, and in the window you will see a different portion of the same screen. But in your mind, you are associating that to the smartphone. So it's quite realistic. So you are preparing the whole page, but you're scrolling on only the part that you need. And there are different trips. I show you a couple of videos that are very nice uh, to see. Okay, And um, paper is, is easy to create. It's cheap. Uh, it's easy to, to draw something that looks like a screen, uh, a screen interface. And you can draw windows, menus, uh, uh, point. You can point uh, in a piece of paper like you did. You would do with a with a finger or with a mouse. You could pretend writing into a checkbox, or you are you can really write with with a pen, or just say, okay, in this box I will write my name. Okay, and uh, uh, you can make them also interactive, dynamic. If you have another person that fakes the computer, that simulates a computer. So the paper is static. But if you have one person that moves the paper, changes the sheet, 
changes the mockup when you are clicking on some button it looks like the paper is responding to your actions and so you have a very good impression of the of the type of interaction that you do or where the, where the user is going to click and then you, you change the screen and the, you see that we, whether the user likes uh, the, the next screen, whether this screen was the, the one they were expecting and so on. And um, let me show so for first the videos, which are, so then we go back tomorrow that we have more time. Uh, a couple of videos, sorry, that are linked here. Let's try to make them. Let's mute the video. And you see this person, this is, a, is an example of, a, of an email application where the person where we see the hands is the, playing the computer and the other per person is interacting. So he's selecting a file for an attachment and, uh, and then the attachment window will appear here because he attached the file. Uh, and then we have uh, some drop-down menu here that appeared. You click on a tab, you send the, the message. And so uh, in your list of messages, uh, you can select a message and the message will appear and so on. Mm -hmm. So we, you already have on paper all the possible screens uh, that are already prepared. All the possible, uh, this person used the, um, a folding approach, okay, for for hiding part of the page and showing on them on on demand, and uh, and many okay overlays like he's doing now for changing part of the interface, and the user is telling I will click here with the with the finger and is changing uh, how the interface would look like uh, according to the action. So they could write uh, messages and uh, open menus and so on. Um, and uh, now the the, the ways of all, of all techniques is is, uh, is even more more uh, more complex because here the simulator is uh, is explicit and uh, it's only doing low level tasks and we'll see that with with all of us uh, later on. And here I have another uh, what is that? I don't see the others. I had two links. Sorry, I don't find the other one. Okay, never mind. Probably say it's in a hidden slide, uh, but uh, uh, you get the idea. So um, we this is the, the final result. Okay, so what we we see tomorrow. Uh, okay, we start. Okay, we are now uh, stopping uh, because it's uh, it's nine. It's um, seven o'clock nearly. Um, we see that. It's an evolution of the sketches, basically, where a single frame of a user interface is transformed into many different frames, where we have the notion of the sequence of these frames, and we can show them to the user. And so it's no longer us, it's no longer the designers that decide the sequence of screens, but it's the user that's really feeling like they were using a real interface because they're clicking somewhere and something will change and something will happen or something will swipe or, so, or some data will appear or disappear. So you know, it's also a way for checking this, if the sequence of actions that the user will be executing is the correct one, is the one we designed, if the user can discover the correct sequence. Okay, so we are putting the user in the condition of executing really a task. With a simplified interface, of course, but uh, we can see where they struggle, where they find difficulties, when they go easy, and so on. And they, we can get uh, um, comments. So the information that we need now is uh, some hints, uh, some suggestions for creating these prototypes. And uh, later on, we see some methods for helping uh, the users evaluate these prototypes. So how can we organize the work with the users to test them? Hmm? Uh, so it's, it will be a, 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 it's important also to use them in the in the right way, in a proper way, in order to get the information that we need out of them. But I just wanted to at least show the video right now because at least we have an idea. We can sleep on this idea, and tomorrow we'll uh, discuss more details about this technique that will be the work uh, of your next uh, um, 
uh, next milestone, by the way. So it's uh, something that uh, you you are you are trying to do. Unfortunately, we cannot test them with real users. Not 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 uh, not every group could do that. Uh, but at least we can at least do some partial testing inside the group uh, for the limitation of not being able to meet. Uh, uh, or to, have, to host too many people in, in the lab. But we'll give you details about how this will map to your deliverable in the course. Okay, so unless there are uh, some questions at the moment, uh, I, I may uh, close uh, this class and so give you a good evening to everybody. And uh, as usual, we meet again on the same place, <laughs> on the same channel tomorrow at 11.30. Okay, good evening to everybody. Bye-bye.